And our first scripture reading this morning is Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 13. Philippians 2, 5 to 13. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and underneath the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. And our second reading is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. 2 Peter 1, 1 to 11. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he's given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil. Desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind, and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never fall, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so having wrapped up our look at the letter of James to really church with the theme of faith in action, showing us what it looks like to live a life of faith, showing us what it looks like to be the new covenant people of God. We've been now taking a little bit of time to dig into some of the things that we've encountered along the way in James, but never really had time to, time to develop. And over the last two weeks, we've been looking a little bit more closely at the ministry of the Holy Spirit, promised in the Old Testament prophecies concerning the new covenant. One of the core promises was that God would cause his Holy Spirit to dwell within us, and that through doing that, he would write his law in our hearts and he would transform us into people who live as the people he's called us to be. And so we talked about how we can, it's a little bit artificial, but we can divide the working of spirit up into two ways. One is God's sanctifying presence, and that is the Holy Spirit living and working within us in a way that transforms us into the image of God in Christ and helps us to live accordingly. But then also God's empowering presence, whereby he empowers us to go out and do the things he's called us to do, that the church might grow and that we might build each other up. And so last week we started looking more closely at God's sanctifying presence, and today we're going to look at how that ought to impact our lives. So if you remember last week, we saw some simple guidelines for pursuing sanctification, and that doing so step by step results in our glorification. So remember, for example, we saw that we're called to do that. Hebrews 12, 14 says, pursue the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. And so obviously the Bible considers it a very important thing that we pursue this sanctification which comes through the working of the Holy Spirit because that's the pathway to seeing the Lord. Second Corinthians gave us a very, very practical, once we got through some of the complicated details, very, very practical way for how we can pursue that. And so referring directly to New Covenant promises, the Apostle Paul tells us that we are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. And so there's that contrast between the Old Covenant, in which the law of God was written on tablets of stone that Moses brought down from the mountain to the people, and they could look on and read, whereas with us, that same law is written into our very hearts by the Holy Spirit. And then Paul goes on, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And he's talking about the Spirit dwelling within us. And so we have liberty, we have freedom in Christ, because where is the Spirit dwelling within us as the temples of God? And then he continues, But we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. And after a little bit of working through 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we saw what that meant was 
When God spoke his, the words of his law to Moses, Moses' face shone with glory because the word of God reveals the glory of God pointing towards Christ. And Moses was able to look at that, but the people of Israel couldn't. And so they were veiled to the glory that was proclaimed through the law. And so Paul talks about how we in the new covenant through the Holy Spirit have that veil removed. So when we look into the word of God, we can see the same glory that Moses saw and that even more we can be transformed into that glory. Not fading away as the old covenant was, but abiding forever as the new covenant is. And so that's why Paul says, so we with all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror, which is the word of God, the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. And so we had our encouragement in Hebrews 12, let us therefore fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfect of our faith, who for the joy sat before him endured the cross, reminding us that we've got some things to endure in this life, just like Jesus did, scorning at shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. <clears throat> so we saw that this, this sanctifying working of the Holy Spirit on our part, pursuing it, begins with taking in the Word of God by reading it, by listening to it, regardless of whether we understand it, because when we need to understand it, the Lord will help us understand through the working of the Spirit what we do need to understand, but we need to bring it into us so it's, it's implanted in us, and also praying to the Lord that He would empower us through His Spirit to understand His Word and to live accordingly. So we saw that, and... So beginning with that, the sanctification then starts to progress into working out, <clears throat> which is the title of this morning's message, Working Out. So when you think of that, <clears throat> you may picture something like this. Well, that's not what the Bible has in mind when it talks about working out. Although interestingly enough, the Bible does talk about physical exercise, and it does talk about how it's a benefit, but in comparison to spiritual exercise, that benefit is relatively small. So 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul writing to Timothy in verse 7 says, train yourself to be godly. And then he goes on, for physical training is of some value. It's interesting, the word that we've translated there, training. <clears throat> King James translates as exercise. If we were to just transliterate it from the Greek into the English, it's gymnasium. It's the word where we get gymnasium from. So when you think about that, it's the place of exercise. So Paul says physical exercise is of some value, and it is, and we know today from medical research just how important it is, and especially as we age, even whatever exercise we do, if it's nothing more than walking, is, can be life, can be life changing. So it is of value, no doubt, and the Bible 2,000 years ago pointed that out to us, but Paul continues, but godliness has value for all things. So in other words, for as, as important as we've come to know physical exercise to be, spiritual exercise is infinitely more important. And that's because it holds promise for both the present life and the life, and the life to come. Then if we look at what Paul says in Galatians, there's an, important, there's an important reminder for us here. He says, speaking to Galatians, he says, This only thing I want to find out from you, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? So in other words, how did you come to... It's the point of salvation. Was it all the good things that you did? Or was it the Holy Spirit working faith within you? And the answer is obviously by hearing with faith. So then he continues, So then are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are now being perfected by the flesh? So we've got to make sure we don't fall into the same trap that the Galatians fell into, and that is they see these exhortations to live out the law of God, to live out God's commandments, to live in a way that's pleasing to God. And, and there's always an urgency, there's a... There's a there's a commandment to it, but they f went off, started going off the rails thinking they were going to do that on their own. So they had this wrong picture that God gave them his spirit to create the faith in them, and then they had to finish the rest themselves. So we don't want to fall into that. We want to remember that what was begun in the spirit will be brought to perfection by the spirit because it's the spirit, 2 Corinthians 3.18 on the side again, it, that's transforming us into God's image from glory to glory. So we have to remember it's the power of the Holy Spirit that enables us to do all these things that we're called to do. We couldn't possibly do it on our own. And then Philippians 2, which was in our first scripture reading this morning. It's a passage we know very, very well because we've come into it time and time again through the years. Paul writes, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. <clears throat> so there's the working out. And... When we did our sermon series a few years back, Fight the Good Fight of Faith, we saw we're able to do that because, verse 13, as we translate it literally, for God is the working one in you. We're the temple of God and the Holy Spirit. God dwells within us, and he's the working one in us, continually working in us. To do what? To will and to work for his good pleasure. So we have a desire to be pleasing to God because God gives us that desire. He works that in us. And we have the ability to start living that out progressively because God gives us that desire 
gives us that ability. So in Christ, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we're called and equipped to live lives of spiritual exercise. And so this sounds great. And the question naturally would be, okay, how do we do that? What does that, what does that look like? We've got the foundation of reading the Bible so we grow in that knowledge. We've got the idea of prayer. But how practically can we do this? Well, our second scripture reading this morning, 2 Peter chapter 1, gives us some very practical guidelines for that. So Peter begins by pointing out that by the grace of God, given to us in Christ, we have been truly transformed into God's image through the working of the Spirit. So think about the first four verses we read this morning. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. There's so many, I don't call them nuggets if you want, so many treasures in here that we could just grab onto and reflect on. So think about that. Peter, one of the chiefest of the apostles, is saying to every single one of us here that we have the same kind of faith as he has. So when we read about the people in the Bible, we don't look up to them as heroes and say, I wish I could be like him because they're writing to us saying, you are. We are like them. We've received the same kind of faith that Peter has. And then he continues, received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Couldn't get a more clear statement of the identity of Jesus than, than that. He is our God and he is our Savior. And then he pronounces a blessing on us. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. There again, time and time again, we cannot escape the idea that if we want to receive the blessings of God, the conduit through which we receive them starts with the knowledge of God, which comes from the Scripture. Understand it or otherwise, the more blessings we want, the more we want our lives to be blessed, the more we want to live lives of joy and peace, the more we've got to make sure we've got that foundation within us. And then he continues, seeing that by his divine power, so there again, it's the working of God that empowers us and equips us for everything. We're never left to our own devices. By his divine power, he's granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. So not just some things, not just a thing here and there, but everything pertaining to life and godliness. How? Here it is again, through the true knowledge of him who called us. Notice how Peter doesn't want us to miss the foundational aspect of our knowledge, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence always bringing us back to glory. When we think about John, we think about Peter and the time they spent with Jesus and how fixed were they on the glory of God that they saw revealed in Jesus and how that was something they pursued and how Paul, having a glimpse of that later on in his life, wanted to pursue that and wanted to share with us the pursuit of that glory of God. And so then he, Peter continues, for by these he's granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. And I should remind you, the Apostle Paul tells us in Corinthians, that for as many as the promises of God may be, they're all yes in Christ Jesus. And he's given us these in order that by them we might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world by lust. And so when Peter talks about us become, becoming partakers of the divine nature, there's two aspects to that, two senses of that. One is through our union with Christ. We've seen that in great detail when we went through John's Gospel, that God dwells in us in Christ through the Holy Spirit. And so through our union with him, him dwelling in us and us in him, we are literally partakers of the divine nature. And then further, in a practical way, in, an, in a tangible, applicable way, as we're being transformed more and more into the image of God in Christ through the working of the Holy Spirit, in that way also we're made partakers of the divine nature. So given this fact, given that we have these promises of God, the working of his grace and love towards us, that is making us partakers of the divine nature, it leads to another question. This is not a visible transformation. We don't physically see it. So unlike Moses, whose face was glowing when he came down from the mountain, unless the sun's shining in through the window, none of us are going to have glowing faces right now. So we can't see it when we look at each other. We can't see it visibly when we look in the mirror. So how do we know it's actually happening? Well, that too, Peter tells us how we can know. We can't see it with our eyes, but we can see it with our heart, and we can see it in the spirit. So in verses 10 and 11, Peter says, Therefore, brothers... Be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. So notice he's pointing out our salvation came from God. We're called by God. We're appointed to eternal life by God. But we need to be sure of it. And how do we do this? If we practice these qualities, and we'll look at the list that he gives us, if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. So there's a promise for you. You want to never fall? Practice these qualities. Notice this practice. Doesn't, practice makes perfect, but it doesn't call us to be perfect. Just practice them. For in this way there will be richly, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
to sum up what this says, I'm just going to quote from the New Bible Commentary because I think they say it very, very well. So here Peter is not teaching that our salvation is to be earned by good works, nor that we can forfeit our relationship to Christ once we've genuinely responded to his call. Rather, he's reminding us that the development of a genuinely Christ-like character is the only proof to ourselves as well as to others of our Christian status, even though we at times sadly fail. And then I stop the quote there, but the commentators go on to list a number of New Testament passages that point to how we will fail on a regular basis as Christians. And so in our imperfections, how do we know that we are truly Christ's? Because we are growing and developing in Christ-like character, that we look more and more like him over the years. Maybe you can look back at yesterday and don't see a difference, or last week and don't see a difference. But when we look back at a year ago, five years ago, ten years ago, we should be seeing a difference, and that's our, that's our evidence. And so he gives us this encouragement that not only does he tell us that we can make sure, but more importantly, he teaches us how to make sure. And it begins with this idea here, being diligent. So in verse 4, Peter says, For by these he's granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, in order that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in this world by lust. And so because of that, because God has made us partakers of the divine nature, what is our response? Apply all diligence. So he's kind of emphatic in how he says that. Diligence in what? What are we doing diligently? In your faith supply, and we'll momentarily look at the list of things we ought to supply, but I want us to notice the two things right here, that we're applying diligence, and then in faith we're doing things in that diligence. And then verse 10, which we had read a slide ago, therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent. So he opens and closes this list of Christian virtues with a reminder that we need to be diligent to do the things that are contained in here. Be diligent to do what? In your faith supply. So carry out these virtues. Why? Because if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. So how can we sum this up? Be diligent to exercise Christian virtues. That's the simple calling. And the list of virtues is relatively simple and straightforward too. So I want to notice I want us to notice a big picture thing here on this list of virtues, and then we will come back and very quickly just run through the individual ones, but they're all relatively straightforward and don't take a lot of, don't take a lot of elaboration. So here's the list. Here's what Peter says. So for this very reason, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. So the first thing we ought to notice, and we'll come back to this, is the telescoping nature of these. In other words, practice this virtue, and then in light of that one, practice this one, and then in light of that one, practice this one. So while each one of these is a separate virtue, they're not all these things we're doing in some scattered, willy-nilly way, but they're all, they're all in conjunction with each other, and each one in light of the other. And we're going to see a very, very nice picture follows from this that gives us something very, very tangible for living out our Christian life. But for now, what I want us to notice is where does the list start and stop? It starts there. It all starts with faith. So in your faith supply and going through this whole list of virtues in this, this, and in this, this, and in this, this, and where does it culminate? Not surprisingly, in love. So remember, we've seen this before, kind of interestingly enough, how we get these coincidences, which we know are not coincidences. So we happen to be on the last of the God's Will readings in the Grace Psalter hymnal, which is the one where they just simply take Jesus summarizing the law and love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul. And the very last statement is, to what does this call us? To lives of faith working through love, which we read responsively earlier. So when Paul tells us in Christ Jesus, in Galatians, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love, that's exactly what Peter talks about here. The life we're called to live is a life of faith working through to love. And in between, he gives us some practical things we can grab onto to help make it all the more, I'll use the word easy, that's a, that's a, loaded, that's a loaded term, but practical in terms of we don't have all these abstract notions. There's lots of abstract notions in the Bible, certainly, but we've got some very, very practical things that we can grab onto and understand. So what he's saying is faith is the foundation of Christian life, and love is both the goal and the outworking of that Christian life. So simple and profound and yet complex all at the same time. So a reminder of the fact that faith is the foundation of Christian life. In Ephesians 2, Paul tells us, for by grace you've been saved through faith. It's the foundation of our new life in Christ. 
Hebrews 11, now faith is the assurance, like the King James, is the substance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And then a few verses later, the author of Hebrews says, and without faith, it's impossible to please him. It's foundational. We want to live a life pleasing to God. It starts with faith. Trust him. Maybe we don't understand everything, but trust him. That's the foundation. And so in 1 Peter, chapter, or in 1 Peter, not 2 Peter, which we're reading today, but in 1 Peter, talking about the trials of life, which we looked at that passage when we went through James. Remember, James said, count it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into various kinds of trials, knowing that those trials work patience. So in a similar way, Peter said, these trials have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, and the Bible means that quite literally. Our faith is more precious than gold. Gold doesn't get us into heaven. We'll perish with our gold. Faith is what gets us into heaven through the grace of God. So our faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Our faith carries us into the kingdom of God, and when we get there, it results in the praise, the glory, and honor of Jesus Christ. It's foundational. So how do we live our life? As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. In many respects, we've got it a lot harder than the people who lived in biblical times because we don't hear God audibly speaking, or maybe we do, but not like they, not like they did. So we don't have Jesus sitting here physically in front of us, teaching us and explaining us. We don't see him. We don't see these things taking place. So it's challenging, and the Bible talks about how we have a special blessing because we believe and yet we don't see him. Quoting from... Genesis, talking about Abraham, covenant with Abraham, the author of Hebrews, Paul quotes this, Peter quotes this, all the New Testament writers quote this verse. My righteous one will live by faith. It's the foundation of the Christian life. So not surprisingly, Peter begins his list of Christian virtues by saying, in faith, supply. And, well, it doesn't hurt to review that the goal of life is love. So Matthew 22, which was in our responsive reading this morning, in response to the question, Rabbi, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and prophets. We've talked about before, the whole Old, Old Testament is basically a practical guideline for here's how we can day-to-day -day love God and love our neighbor. So notice that the scripture Jesus is referring to that's pointing to him, that's pointing to how we live before God, is exactly last week in 2 Corinthians 3 what Paul said reveals the glory of God. That when we look at it with unveiled hearts and minds through the Holy Spirit, it's what transforms us. Think about John at the end of his life in 1 John, how he saw the importance of this love, how it is the goal of the Christian life. And so in 1 John he writes, Beloved, let us love one another. There's that brotherly love that Peter talks about, second from the end. Beloved, let us love one another. Why? For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God. John is referring back to John chapter 3. If you want to see the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. That's the working of the Holy Spirit. So everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And the one who does not love does not know God. Why? For God is love. And we've talked about this. God in his very nature is love. There's an abstraction for us. It's hard to wrap our minds around. But God is love. And by this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. John 3.16 is echoed through there. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And then John continues, so, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has beheld God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. And it comes always back full circle to the union we have with God in Christ. So with that in mind, what sits in between, what Peter sits practically in between the faith as the foundation and the love as the goal and the outworking is this list of Christian virtues. So I'll just quickly read through it again. For this reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, in moral excellence, knowledge, in knowledge, self-control, in self-control, perseverance, in perseverance, godliness, in godliness, brotherly kindness, in your brotherly kindness, love. It's not much to say about that. Faith, we understand what that is. Substance of things hoped for, assurance of things not seen. It's trusting God. It's taking God at his word, regardless of whether we can see it working out or not. Moral excellence, that's pretty straightforward. Live upright lives. How many times, especially in the Psalms, are we called to be upright? Psalm, Psalm 1, read about Psalm, Psalm 1 and it, read Psalm 1 and talks about the upright in heart and how we're the ones who will see God. So this call to be upright. In your moral excellence, knowledge. 
the word knowledge there is talks about an intimate, a deep knowledge. And so we never get away from that. And your knowledge, self-control, that's, that's straightforward. Self-control, live in a disciplined way. Perseverance, that came up in, in James, count it all joy, my brethren. In Peter, comes up time and time again, Jesus himself, when he said goodbye, said in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. So perseverance is straightforward, just endurance, being patient, hanging in there through the ups and downs, adversities of life. Godliness is an interesting word there. If we took that word godliness and just literally translated it, it's a compound word that we would translate literally as well worship. So well is in the sense of good or right. If we were living several hundred years ago, we might be inclined to translate that as piety. It's a word we don't use very often anymore. Piety is equivalent to godliness, but it's, it's this picture of we worship God through how we live. So yes, we're here gathered every Sunday morning for about an hour and 15 minutes, worshiping God as God's community, but our real worship for God is how we live the rest of the week outside of that hour and 15 minutes. By the things we think when we're alone, by the things we talk about, the things we do, that's showing how we worship God, because even worship itself, we've talked about before, comes both in English and Greek, ironically enough, from two words, worth and ship. In other words, expressing how we value. So godliness is lives showing how we value God. And then in that brotherly kindness or love of the brethren, Philadelphia, certainly a brotherly love, because the Greek word is Philadelphia. Phileo is love, and Adelphi is, is brothers. And in your brotherly kindness, love. So let's pull this together, and I'll, you can mull this over later when it, goes up on, when it goes up on the website, and it takes some time and walk through it and see this progression. So in faith, be upright. In the New Covenant, God writes his law in our hearts. So he puts within us this innate sense of right and wrong. It's not perfect, it will be flawed, we'll misunderstand things. There'll be things that are wrong that we think are right. There'll be things that we think, so there'll be things we think are wrong that are right. There'll be things that we think are right that are wrong. We'll be wrong on both accounts without the knowledge of God's word. But nevertheless, there's going to be this innate sense of doing what's right. And so the beginning point is, in faith, do what you think is right, based on your best knowledge at the time. And the Bible elsewhere talks about, to the one who thinks it's wrong and does it, it's sin. The Bible talks all kinds of places about Christian liberty, about things that are neither here nor there. So there are day-to-day -day habits that people do. The Bible doesn't say they're right or wrong, it's indifferent. But if a person thinks that habit is wrong, that activity is wrong and they do it, then they're sinning. If the person thinks it's right and they do it, then they're not sinning, as long as it's not something that's covered by something black and white. So that's why Peter begins with this idea of living uprightly, based on whatever knowledge we've got, whatever innate sense of right and wrong we've got, the starting point is through faith, live an upright life. And then notice what comes right after the uprightness, the moral excellence. That's where we get to knowledge. So in your faith and with an upright heart, go to the Bible, go to the Lord, and grow in knowledge. Because what's actually going to do is going to refine your sense of right and wrong. It's going to refine your knowledge of how you ought to live with God. And so it's, we're, it's like this snowballing effect. And then from there, armed with this growing knowledge that comes through faith and with an upright heart, then we need to exercise self-control. So start to live in accordance with the knowledge we've got. Do our best. It'll be a struggle, and it's not always going to work, but to do that. And then as we're beginning to exercise that self-control and discipline, living the way we're called to live, in that we need to be patient, knowing that we're going to have ups and downs in life, knowing that there's going to be times things happen to us and around us that don't really square with the promises of God that we see in Bible. And so we trust him at those points, recognizing that God does cause all things to work together for good for those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. And then through all of these things collectively, we practice piety, living lives of worship, showing God through how we live and how we think what we think of him. And as we worship God with our lives, we love our fellow Christians because we're called to be members of the body of Christ. So yes, each one of us has our own relationship with God through Christ, but it's in the context of the local church and then the church universal that we are collectively the body of Christ and we're a community. And he called us as individuals and plunked us into a body and now we have this community life. So loving our fellow Christians and collectively all of this together when we're doing all of that, we are automatically loving God and neighbor. Kind of like what Matthew or what Jesus said through Matthew. Peter gives us a spiritual barometer here. I don't know if you're like me, sometimes you read something in the Bible and there's just something about the way it's worded that sticks with you. And this has stuck with me for, I don't know, it was, it was 1993 when I came to faith in Christ. And reading this, reading this early on, this, this really stuck with me the way Peter worded this. So Peter says in verse 8, giving us a spiritual barometer to assess ourselves. 
For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, so it sounds good. We should be exercising all these virtues and it should be in a growing way. Terrific. And notice what he says. He doesn't say, then you will be effective, then you will be useful and fruitful. But he actually says it in the negative way. And it's always stuck with me. That keeps you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what he's telling us is we can have knowledge of the Lord and it can be useless and fruitless. So just simply knowing the word of God is pointless. James, when he talked about it, said, the demons believe and they shudder. So there's this idea of being effective and fruitful. So if these qualities are not ours, right off the top, James is telling us, in that case, then we're ineffective and unfruitful in our knowledge of the Lord. It's just squandered on us. God has squandered his knowledge on us. And what does the Bible say about not casting your pearls before swine? So sometimes we have to look at ourselves that way. It puts us back on track when we humble ourselves and recognize that. So what if these qualities are ours? Even that may not be enough because Peter says if these qualities are yours and are increasing and are growing, then and only then are you kept from being ineffective and unfruitful. So there's this idea that either you're growing or you wither. There's no in-between. There's no status quo in the kingdom of God that we're either moving in the right direction or we're moving in the wrong direction. And so he continues, for whoever lacks in these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. What does is, what is Jesus talk about in his letter to the church in Laodicea in the beginning of Revelation? You've forgotten, you've left your first love. You've forgotten your first love. And so we need to not forget our first love. Paul's a little bit more blunt than Peter. Peter was general, gentle in how he worded it. Paul words a little bit more bluntly. To a dysfunctional church in Corinth, he says, Test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? I didn't put verse 6 up there, but it's interesting. In verse 6, he says, we know we pass the test, implying, what about you? So there are places where there's this bluntness in the Bible. You want more bluntness, Matthew chapter 7, the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, many will come to me that day saying, Lord, Lord, did we not do this, that, and the other thing in your name? He'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never... For I never knew you. So when all the people in the New Testament, Jesus, John, Peter, Paul, all of them are telling us, keep examining yourself. Not because we need to see perfection, but we just simply see, need to see long-term progress. And we're like that snail. Okay, snails don't have feet, so I'm mixing my metaphors here. Three steps forward, two steps back. Snail goes up, the well wall slides back down. You, know, you, get, you get the point. The analogy I kind of used before is when you're climbing a mountain trail, Tops here, you start here, but the trail you're going is going to go uphill sometimes, downhill sometimes, and that's like our spiritual journey. In the moment, sometimes we're going forward, sometimes we're going backwards, but overall, when we look back, we're heading, towards, we're heading towards Christ, we're heading towards the top. And so as we start to head towards our, head towards our close, Peter here has given us both practical guidelines for spiritual living and growth, and also how we can examine ourselves for proof of spiritual life. Because God always gives us the promise, if we don't like what we see when we examine ourselves, just turn to him, and that's it. Because what do we need to please God? Faith. That's it. It's by faith we please him. So notice how John does the same thing. He describes our proof, this proof, this evidence of spiritual life. In 1 John chapter 5, John says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So there again, we see this simple picture. The proof of the spiritual life. Reminder that spiritual life is life in Christ through the Holy Spirit. The proof of spiritual life is very simply faith, working through love, resulting in obedience. Very simple and easy to understand. And the Bible drops in practical, easy to follow steps along the way. So as we wrap things up, let's remember that we are, as Christians, partakers of the divine nature. Second Peter, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises in order that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature. Think about when we started John's Gospel, John chapter 1, talking about Jesus, who was in the beginning with God, and he was God. And then he became flesh and he dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, glories of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And what do we get out of that? What we get out of that is this. John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, that's how we receive him, is by believing in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The Bible gives us a principle that like begets like. And so when it calls us children of God, which 
we weren't by our physical birth. That's made clear in the next verse. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It's that new birth, John chapter 3, that you must be born again, born of the Spirit. So when the Bible tells us that we are the children of God in Christ, it means we're like him. We're made partakers of the divine nature. That 2 Corinthians 3.18, we're being transformed into his image from glory to glory. So when you call yourself a child of God, and we've all said that out loud before, maybe I'll say that, what are we? We're children of God. So when we say that, we're children of God, which means not just we have a relationship with him, but we're being made like him. Think about Hebrews chapter 12, after chapter 11. 11 was the chapter devoted to all the examples of faith. And then in chapter 12, the author says, comparing our earthly fathers with God, our loving heavenly father, our earthly fathers disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best. But God, our Father in heaven, disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness, partake in his holiness, that his holiness is conferred to us by his Holy Spirit. Why is the Holy Spirit called holy? Because he's God, and God is holy. And that's being conferred to us through the ups and downs in life. Romans 8, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to what? To be conformed to the image of his Son. There's all kinds of verses we can look at. Colossians, for example, or Hebrews, talking about how Jesus is the exact representation of the glory and the image of God. 2 Corinthians 3.18, we'll have this memorized before we're done. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. And so the promise that we have is this. Beloved, now we are children of God. In other words, we are begotten of God. We are like God. And it has not appeared as yet what we shall be. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him just as he is. And so we're going to close with this. We're called to work this out. Ephesians 4.23 calls us to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and, holy, and holiness. There's those Christian virtues. Colossians 3, put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. Our reading this morning, 2 Peter 1.10, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. And we'll close with this. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not my presence only, but now much more my absence, work out your salvation. Live outwardly what we are on the inside. What God has made us inwardly, work it out, live it out, do these things, exercise the Christian diligence. And how can we possibly do that impossible task? Because God is the working one in us, both to will and to work according to his good pleasure. So, brings us full circle back to seek God's will in his, through his word and through prayer, and seek his ability to give us both the will to do it. If you don't feel like doing what God wants, ask him to work his will in you so that you do desire it. If you have trouble doing it, and we all do, ask that he would help us to do that, because that is his promise. And so our song of response this morning is a song that captures these ideas together, and, and it is when we walk with the Lord. So let's stand and join together singing when we walk with the Lord.